So hello, everybody. Um, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that I am what's standing between you and lunch. The good news is I only have 27 slides, so bear with me. Uh, before we start, a few words about who I am. So my name is Gilad Ben Yosef, and I work for ARM on uh, cryptography and security in general. Specifically, I'm the maintainer of the ARM Tratzone CryptoCell Linux device driver. I've been working on and around the Linux kernel for quite some time. Some of you may also know me as the core for building embedded Linux systems, uh, which really is just to say that I've been working on the Linux ecosystem for quite a while. So uh, this talk is actually based on uh, a true story, something that actually happened to me that triggered me to make this talk. I went on for a vacation in Slovenia, by the way, uh, which I'm, I'm quite confident is a conspiracy by SD card makers, uh, the whole country. It's just so beautiful that you just have to keep taking more pictures. But unfortunately, uh, vacations end, so I went back home, and I opened the door to my house after being uh, away, and I heard a siren, which is not something you expect to hear in your own home. Uh, and it turns out that the siren was coming for some CCTV, right, a camera, in-home in camera, that was supposed to record what's going on in my home. But after some, uh, you know, looking into things, it turned out uh, my specific version of the CCTV uh, was taking somebody to control of it, um, and, and luckily for me, they chose to do a distributed denial of service attack against who knows where, rather than trying to take pictures of me going down to eat something in my undies late at night, uh, which is a bothering thought, not just to me, but also should be for the rest of the world, if you have seen me in my undies. But anyway, I digress. Um, th and this really made me very sad, because I'm actually, you know, I'm working on security infrastructure in Linux, and I should have mentioned this, the CCTV, the specific CCTV box that I was using uh, was actually running Linux. Um, and I was sad because I know that we, as a community, as an ecosystem, can do better. We actually have the tools to do better. They might need not be perfect, but we're working on them. Um, and the purpose of my talk is sort of discuss or explain how we can do better when we are building these embedded systems, these smart devices. So the problem definition basically is that we use smart devices for everything. And smart device for me is just my ongoing definition for anything between, you know, uh, CCTV, a cell phone, uh, a DVR, set, set box, uh, our cars, right? It's a smart device, it's an embedded device. More often than not, it's running Linux. We use these things for everything. And that means we need to trust them. That's not so easy, and it's sadly or happily on us to deliver. So what does it mean, trust? What does it mean to trust a smart device? So what do we want, right? So as you see here, what we want is secure devices, and we want that just after we finish downloading this completely random app for somewhere on the internet, uh, which is maybe a funny way to say that we want to keep our secrets, right, me and my undies. Uh, we want our devices to save us, serve us, excuse me, not some malicious stranger, right? I want the CCTV device to uh, take pictures of my cat mangling my kitchen, not DDoS, some random server on the internet. But we also, at the same time, want the device to be connected. Uh, we want a frictionless user experience. We don't want it to ask for a password or whatever. And we want an open-ended device, something we can install software on, uh, a generic device in some way, you know, the app ecosystem and all that. And of course, these things conflict, right? So there lies our problem. 
We want a secure environment, a secure device, but we want to do things with them which are inherently dangerous. And that means that we're going to fail. Uh, and that means that in order to get secure devices, devices we can trust, it's not enough to have a first line on defense. We need to assume it's going to fail in some way or form. And we need to think about what does it mean to fail safely? What's trusted way of failing? So, again, what do we want? We want that if someone took hold of our device uh, temporarily, okay, we don't want them to have access to all the secrets on this device, whether these secrets are pictures that we don't want them to see or uh, encryption keys or what have you. If someone broke in, right, um, to a specific device, we don't want that to manifest and to be able to uh, gain additional access to additional resources. If some unauthorized change occurred, we want to know about it, right? If somebody changed our kernel under the hood without our knowing or any other software, uh, it will be good to be alerted to this. If somebody broke in, if by mistake we ran some malware, it would be really good if we could just reboot and forget. So what I'm talking about is the threat model of dealing with a malicious entity that got some sort of temporary hold of our device. It could be some evil government, you know, a tyranny, getting hold of our device during custom inspections. Or it could be something like a malware that has been run on device because there was some security flaw. What can we do then? This is what I'm going to talk about. So how do you build such a, such a system? So it turns out we actually have the components. We have tons of components. We have more components than we actually necessarily need, so there's more than one way to do it. And the purpose of this talk is going over these components now and try to explain how to fit them together because I think that more often than not, the problem isn't necessarily how to use a specific component, but figuring out how it fits to the big picture, right? And hopefully that would be easier than getting hot water from the hot water faucet at uh, a certain a and lounge I was at. You can see the instruction for that there. So let's start. And when we start, we want to start at the beginning. Let's start when the system boots, okay? So, there is this concept of a secure boot or verify boot, or name differ, uh, and there's actually seven versions of this, seven standards. I'm describing one. I actually follow the Android style secure boot or verify boot, but the general concept is actually the same. Okay? So we have a device, it powers on. There's some bootloader, probably some firmware before, uh, that loads the kernel and the kernel runs in it. And what we want to achieve is to get a chain of trust, right? To have some sort of root of trust um, in hardware, in firmware, something that we can rely on and use that to create a chain whereby we, this component verifies the next one. So for example, we can have a firmware running really early on in the boot something which is not trivial to change, right? It's in ROM or in EEPROM, something like that, that uses some secret inside the hardware to verify the bootloader, right? So it reads the image of the bootloader, take a hash, take a cryptographic signature, and only if it matches will it let it run. And the bootloader then, of course, uh, can do the same for the kernel image. And this is what I mean by a chain of trust. We start with something we have some high-level trust on, some secret in the hardware. Could be a ROM with a signature, a ROM with a, a public key. We'll see in the, uh, as we go along further how that works. And we use that to verify the next stage, and the next stage that we now trust can verify the next stage, and so on. So verify the kernel, load the data, and now the question is, OK, so we have a kernel. We just took hashes and signatures, so we know it's cool. How do we go on from there? So the Android 
solution for that, or the start of the solution for that, is something called, they, in Android parlance, verified boot. In the Linux kernel, we relied, re relate to it as DM Verity. It's a Linux device mapper target named Verity that provides a transparent integrity checking of read-only block devices. Okay, so I have some file, executable file in a file system. I load it, and I want to know that it was not changed by some malicious entity that may have access to my device. And DM Verity helps prevent persistent rootkit that can hold onto root privileges. That means if somebody was able to get access to my device and even run something, uh, and even you know, break into the kernel, what, ha what have you, if I get, can get to a situation that if he changes the persistent storage, I know, then, uh, and, and stop that, right? Then I can get rid of that malware by simply rebooting. And this is what DM Verity does. And this was what happened if you took a device, specifically an Android device, and change the root file system that holds the uh, application uh, without you know, regenerating the signature that DM Verity worked with. You'll just get a message, we cannot boot your device. Somebody tamper with it, stop. You might ask yourself, why, why is this different than what I mentioned with the kernel of the bootloader? Why can't we just take, OK, there's a blob of the file system, right? You can take a hash signature. Uh, I know the previous state is trusted because chain of trust. What's different? So what's different is size and speed, right? The kernel is maybe bigger than we want, but it's not that big. A file system can be much bigger, and we don't necessarily um, access each part of it at the same time, certainly not at boot. It would really sh be a shame if we need to wait long, or should I say longer time, than we already do when our device starts, just because we want to hash the entire file system, even though there are files that we may never use. So DM Verity does something smart. Uh, it uses a construct called a Merkle tree, not this Merkle tree. This has nothing to do with it. Uh, a Merkle tree, which is a, a construct which says something like this. Let's take our storage device, all the block in the storage device, right? And for each block, we'll compute a checksum hash. And we'll keep a hash of this block. And we'll keep blocks of the hashes together and hash them. Therefore, and do it again and again until we have a root hash, right? Something that basically includes some sort of data from each and every one bit in the other line blocks. The cool thing about that is that if we can get a trusted root hash, right? If we, for example, sign that root hash with some public key, which is part of the firmware, which cannot be changed, I know that root hash is valid. I can then read this Merkle tree of other hashes from the storage, I can trust them because each one of them will hash back to a block that hashes back to a block that in the end goes and hashes to the root hash. And I know that that one is trusted. So if they match, the hashes are OK. And if the hashes are OK, that means that when I read a block from storage, I can compute the hash on it. And if it matches the hash that is written uh, beside it on some other file system or the same file, uh, on the same block device, sorry, I know that it has not been changed, OK? So this is the way to get to a system that even if a somebody got a hold of your device and ma managed to run a malware on it, if it changes the root file system, unless it can break the chain of trust and change the, the root hash that is stored, hopefully signed with a plug public key on the, the firmware or the hardware, then you know about it. You can stop booting. You can tell the user something's wrong. Okay, so this is the Verity. It's actually very simple to use. Okay, you can see here a very simplified example of the commands used to set up something like that. And this example actually uses loopback devices. Of course, this also works with real block devices. So Verity set up format. Here's my file system. Here's uh, another block device or it can be the same block device with an offset, no problem, where I want to store the Merkle tree. And it does its thing, and it will report back the root hash, that long string of numbers there. And that I keep in a safe place, right? That I either burn into the hardware or I sign it with a public key, which is in the hardware or something. I get to a situation where I can trust that. And then 
when I uh, create this DM Verity mapping, I can mount the file system. And if something changes, the kernel will catch me, say the hash doesn't ma does not match, refuse to use the block. Right? I'll get an IO error. And it actually has folder error correcting and so on. So just, just one bit of random error will not cause catastrophic uh, results. OK, so we have one block of our you know, system. And that block is good. This model is good for securing a file system which is inherently read-only in a smart device. You know, the one that has the application that are the binaries. That, that does not change often. It changes when we do some sort of update. And when I do the update, I can also update this uh, signature, and it's fine. But of course, this gives me some sort of integrity check. Um, and it's good for read-only device. What about the other stuff? What about the picture of my cats? What about the stuff that changes, you know, user data? So for that, we actually have more than one solution. The simplest, and I think very effective, is called, in Android parlance, full disencryption. It's actually relying on the underlying mechanism called dmcrypt uh, in the kernel. And you can see it here what it does, and you can sort of guess from the name. Basically, the encrypt provides transparent whole disk or partition or block device encryption as part of device mapper mapping. That means that the file system does not know anything about encryption. The underlying block device does, may or may not know anything about encryption. We put the layer in the middle that worries about the encryption. It actually supports a whole bunch of advanced mode of operation, XTS, ESSIV, and so on and so forth. For those not familiar with these terms, there are a name of uh, cryptographic algorithms or mode of operation that are relevant to storage encryption, used by Android to implement its full disencryption, as it is called. Uh, and it can optionally, if you use the right uh, cryptographic mode, um, AEAD, can actually also, in conjunction with another device mapper uh, entity called, uh, model called DM Integrity, provide not just encryption, but also integrity. So again, you will know not only that somebody cannot read the file if it doesn't have the key, they will also know that you can also know that the file was not changed by somebody that doesn't have the key. Right. So if the inverity gives us a good answer for, let's say, binaries, this one gives a good answer for application data. And again, a very simplified example of how one uses this thing. So there's a utility called Crypto Setup. Uh, again, it supports a whole bunch of formats, legacy, other operating system, what have you. Uh, simplest one just looks format. And again, I'm using in this example a loopback device, but of course, any block device will do uh, as well. So I'm just saying, look, I, I want to use the uh, encrypt with this uh, FS3 image. I open the device, I make the, the connection, uh, and it will actually stop and ask me at this point what's the password, right, to encrypt this stuff. And then I have a block device, which is like any other block device, read write, and I can format it normally, mount it normally, unmount it normally, but I cannot access the data unless I do the second step and provide the right password, right? It's cryptographically uh, secure. OK, interesting. So we have an easy way to test the verity or veracity of uh, application data. And we have a way to do the same for read-write data. And we actually have enough to start talking about, OK, how does the system look like? OK? Uh, of course, I'm going to complicate this as we go along, but basics are all here. So we have some sort of boot ROM, something you cannot easily change, right? Real, real ROM or EPROM or something that you have some manner of trusting that is not easily changeable. And that boot ROM, when it loads, reads a public key that it uses when it reads the next um, stage of booting. Could be directly the bootloader, could be some firmware. We'll discuss why firmware later. And that next stage comes not just with the blob of whatever it is we want to run, 
it also comes with some sort of cryptographic signature, which is signed using the public key. So I can verify that it was not changed. So I know the firmware is OK. The firmware does the same for the bootloader. Uh, the bootloader does the same for the kernel. And this is how that goes. And then the kernel, which I know can be trusted, uses the encrypt to verify the read-write kind of data, the user data, and the Verity to verify the read-only application file system data. Each stage verifies the next. The public key may not actually be in the hardware. One possible implementation is put a cryptographic hash of the public key in the, the EPROM or what have you, and use um, and put the actual public key in the image itself. I know it's the right one, because otherwise the, ha the hash would match, and so on. Uh, there can be more than one public key. There may be a chain of them. Right? There might be a key that the chip maker holds, which uh, they use to sign the key for the SOC provider, which signs the key for the OEM making the device. Okay? That works too. So there's a lot of ways to play with this, but this is the basic setup. And of course, I'm not showing it here, but you don't have to have one of these. Right? If you want to do an AB kind of uh, safe upgrade, you can give two images of either one of these including, of course, the kernel and so on. OK, so we see that it only, with only two components, we get a system that has this property, or more of this property, of being uh, able to sort of fail in a more trusted way. Right? So even if somebody took a hold of our device, if this is in effect, he will not necessarily if, if it's the device is not booted, for example, he will not be able to read our files. He will not be able to change the binary later. Okay? Even if he took a hold of the device while it's already you know, running, uh, then he might be able to read our files because the, the device key is in effect. But he will not be able to change um, the application data for next boot. Okay? Uh, so all I have to do to get rid of them is reboot the device. In theory, there are, of course, attacks on these methods as well. But it's a great start. So what can we do next? What's, what's bugging us? Well, encrypting a whole disk with one key or a whole block device with one key is good, certainly better than nothing at all. Um, it's not fine grade enough uh, for certain situations. For example, if you have multiple users, and now we have multiple users, even of our phones, right? I can hand over the phone to somebody that does not necessarily mean I want to also hand over uh, the ability to see pictures of me in nudes, right? Uh, so, um, and there are other interesting problems. Like, for example, if we encrypt uh, all, the, all the data in the device in the same key, we must provide it as the system boots, right? There's no, no alternative, because as the system starts, you have to punch this in. This can be a bit of a problem. Uh, for example, something that really happened for a long time, Android system that was relying on what I described before had this silly problem where if you set up your alarm clock right, um, to wake you up in some certain hour, and then for whatever reason, you know, uh, the, the system rebooted. Maybe there was an, an update and so on. What happened is the system got to the prompt that asked the user to enter his uh, password or press the fingerprint thing and stop there because the user was sleeping, so their alarm did not, wait, uh, did not, did not go off right? because the whole disk is encrypted. And the software that is needing to ring the alarm is on the decrypted disk, but the user is sleeping. So that may sound silly, but it's something that actually happens and bothers the users. Uh, and this makes some OEM either not enable this feature or some users to turn it off, and then we get back to non-secure system. So, to resolve this problem of multiple users and the scenario I'll describe, uh, one of the things that we can use, and is actually also used by Android today, the latest revisions, is file, -based, file system based encryption. That is, take out the encryption for the um, layer beyond the file system and put it inside a file system. And this gives us uh, the ability to have a more fine grained control. In fact, uh, FScript, file system encryption, um, allow us to encrypt each directory separately. So we choose a directory, and we assign some key to that directory, and we can have another directory with a different key. Uh, and 
Of course, support for this needs to go into each and every operating system. There's some core library that is common to all, but each operating system needs to enable this. Currently enabled in XD4, UBFS, and F2FS. Uh, as, and as, as I said, it allows a more fine-grain uh, approach. For example, giving different users of the system different encryption keys for their directories, or uh, giving different stages of the system uh, different encryption keys. So, for example, the code that is needed for the alarm clock may be encrypted with a key, which is just part of the root partition or something like that. Right? So it may be less secure, but at least the user will wake up, which is you know, useful. And the idea behind this is that it is designed to protect against occasionally temporary offline compromise of the block device content, while loss of confidentiality of some file metadata, including file size and permission, is tolerable. That's a quote from you know, a spec. Um, and what that means is that what this is designed to do is to assume that you lost um, control right, of, for example, your phone and your device for a little while. It was at the, at the customs when the, uh, the evil government agent took a hold of it, or uh, you left it in the hotel and some criminal got in and, and did something. And the idea, but, but that is a temporary thing, right? And the idea is that even that temporary um, you know, loss of control of your device shouldn't manifest itself to the ability to later read everything else, either that was encrypted before, assuming the device was not booted uh, and, the, and the password was not inserted, Right? or in the future. Uh, it does protect the file names currently, but it does not protect other metadata, for example, file sizes. So there's some interesting things you might be able to do with file sizes. So it's not perfect, but again, it's an interesting step. So again, an example how this works. Uh, it's a little bit more involved. Sorry for the small fonts. So I have to create some random key which is what this stage is. And uh, then I have to get a descriptor for this key. Basically, think about it as a signature for the key, <coughs> uh, because it's simply not easy to um, type in the 512 uh, bits of the key every time, right? So it's easier to keep it in a file and have some descriptor. And then I insert it into the kernel. Right, the kernel has a subsystem called the key subsystem that is designed to do exactly that, right? keep secret key material for uses like that, and the encrypt uses that. So I'm letting the kernel know that I have a new key, and please keep it inside safely, and gives me the, uh, the, the key uh, descriptor, so we can talk in the same language. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different details about working with the key ring of the keys file system. There are different key rings that I can use. I'm not going to go into all these details now, but you can see here the output of the command key control show. They just show me which key ring are active, and I can see that I have a new logon key here, which is used or can be used by the XD4 file system. So I taught the kernel about the key. I haven't done anything with the file system yet. Uh, let's make some test. Uh, directory on the file system that supports uh, encryption. And then I can send the policy that says this directory is now attached or associated with the key whose uh, descriptor is this. And henceforth, uh, I, I will, um, this directory is basically encrypted with the key I provided, uh, whereas the content is this encryption mo uh, mode and the file names are protected with that encryption mode and so on and so forth. And that means that now we can write data to this thing and you know, see all the content so long as the key is in the kernel. And if I log out or if I time out from my device or whatever, you can remove the key at which point, which is what we're doing there, at which point you were not able to read any of the data. And in fact, if you will go to this directory and just do an LS, you will see that instead of the file names, there's this random junk, which is guaranteed to be something which is ASCII. You, know, you can see it. You can see there are files there, but you do not know what the file name. So it's sort of a compromise that you don't want. You want to be able to let the user know that there are files there, but you don't know, want them to learn about the file name, the true file name, Unless, of course, 
they can supply the key. Uh, and of course, if I try to read such a file, I'll get the error that I don't have the key. And if I'll try to put in the wrong key, at least the current versions will just uh, output random junk. I think newer version, uh, they're working on changing that to actually say, no, no, that's not the right key. OK. Um, so this is interesting. We can do a little bit better if we ask the self a question, uh, well, how could this fail? So the problem here is this key thing, right? Um, at some point, I need to take the key for somewhere and, OK, put it in the kernel. And now I need to trust the kernel to keep a good hold of it. But my assumption is that that will fail at some point because this is you know, the game we're playing. Can we do something a little bit better? Can we maybe find a good way to keep the key safe? So there's actually several solutions for that. One of them, uh, a trusted execution environment. Uh, and the idea with trusted execution environment is that it is some sort of a hardware feature. And there are such features in both on um, processor. There it's called Trust Zone. There's something very similar in Intel called SGX, AMD is SEE. They're not exactly the same. The general idea, however, is. And the idea is basically that, and here I'm showing Trust Zone because I work for ARM, but you know, in the general concept is the same, that I have my normal reach OS for us guys or girls. It's just Linux as we know it. And it's running as usual. But the processor we're running on has an extra mode, sort of like virtualization, if you will, where in that extra mode has access um, to memory and maybe other resources of the hardware that a hardware enforces cannot be accessed when I'm running in the normal mode. And the idea is that I can put here something very minimal, right? something that, in theory, at least, the attack vector is smaller because it's not a full operating system. It's really a library, if you will, although it's called a trusted OS, and keep my secrets there. So, for example, I can do something like uh, use uh, a callback interface into this safe area to ask my trusted operating system, or really a library, but don't tell them I told you so, um, to keep the key for me, okay? And for example, not deliver it to the user ever, uh, just deliver it maybe to the kernel, or in some, and this is not upstream, but it's possible to never let the kernel have access to the key at all, but let the trusted OS, for example, to put the key or deliver the key to a hardware crypto engine that can use it to open my file without the normal operating system having control of it. Now, this is useful, and it's used in probably all of your phones and many other devices. It's not a silver bullet because a trusted operating system does not mean it does not have bugs. It does. And sometimes these errors mean that somebody can take over the trusted operating system and so on and so forth. But again, it's another layer that we can use uh, to defend ourselves. And you can see here, a little bit complicated, you try to follow me, if you will, uh, how we can use this to do something more safer with uh, the keys that I describe for FScript. So we have some master key blob sitting in uh, the storage. And say, on the setup time, and I use it to, uh, I, I use the master key to encrypt, uh, excuse me, I use some hardware key, uh, which can be something actually in the hardware, but it can also be just a key that is in memory or some flash device that is only accessible for the TE. And I use that to encrypt um, that key that we discussed before. <coughs> and on setup time, I just encrypt that. And what I'm doing is that when the system boots, for example, in order to get a hold of that key, the user needs to provide something. Right? It can be a password, or it could be a pattern, or it could be a fingerprint. But here is the cool thing. The cool thing is that what is reading this password or the fingerprint and so on uh, is hardware connected not to the normal operating system, but to the TE. Right? So it's, it cannot be taken away. It cannot be stolen. And that master key is then used to uh, derive uh, two 
uh, keys in the case of Android, one a device key and one a user key. Device key is the stuff we use to encrypt stuff like our alarm clock, right? So we can, it's tied to just something in the hardware. And that means that when the device, for example, a phone, wakes up, it already has access to that key uh, in a safe enough manner so it can decrypt the files needed for the, the phone. But when the user wakes up, to get access to his secret or her secret files, you need something more. You need a password or a fingerprint or a UTF uh, device. Uh, and then FScript does its things and encrypts the um, files and the file name using those uh, algorithms. OK. Um, I talked about one option to do this. There's something which is sort of similar or related. Uh, which does not necessarily have to go with a trusted execution environment. Uh, but it's sort of the same idea, but a hardware model, right? Basically, what we're doing is taking some software, using a hardware um, facility to run this software in something which is more contained and ideally isolated. But it's still software. It still might have bugs. I can, instead, put some hardware off of the CPU, uh, which is hopefully safe, uh, and let it keep the keys uh, involved. And one such example uh, is it's really a standard, right? It's not a specific hardware called Trusted Platform Model, which is basically a hardware model that keeps your secret, right? It has uh, some persistent uh, memory that allows it to keep uh, encryption keys, and it has the ability to actually execute encryption functions on that device, which means, for example, I can check the signature of something or sign something without actually the software having any access to the key. And again, this isn't a silver bullet either, because, of course, just like we had bugs in um, TE software running in uh, Trust Zone or whatever, there are also, and there's one very, very um, recent bug in one of the very, um, the most used uh, chips that are used for TPM models, right? So we can also have errors there. But again, the idea is to put one more layer of security. There's one more thing you can do with this, which is cool. This thing has the ability to do attestation and binding, which are terms that mean I can feed it some sort of a hash of the state of the hardware and software, and it knows some sets state that the system needs to be in order to um, satisfy itself and remote users that the system is in the right um, status, that it's not been compromised. And either attest to that to somebody remote, or only if this is the case, allow me to get access to specific keys of the TPM or other keys which are signed or, uh, excuse me, not signed, um, encrypted with that TPM key. Um, and here you can see an example of a more advanced system setup. Uh, basically, what we've done is we added the firmware now actually boots also the trusted OS in parallel to the kernel. They're not really actually in the same time, okay? But it sets up the trusted OS and the kernel. And the kernel can have services from the trusted OS, such as getting the keys for FScript for a specific directory, when a specific user signs in with his fingerprint or otherwise. OK, one more topic, very advanced, maybe not still really useful today, but I think very interesting. It's the whole Linux subsystem integrity measurement architecture, uh, which is software in Linux that working with the TPM can measure the state of the system, right? Remember, I told you the TPM can get these hashes of the state of the system. Somebody needs to feed it, this system, this state, and this is IMA. It can attest to the system reliability locally, right? It can take the hash it has of the state or a specific resource and says, OK, this is what I expect. And it can also attest to that remotely. By the way, if you're wondering what that word is, attest, attestation simply means giving evidence of your reliability, just like this picture here, which I filmed in Thailand, that says genuine fake Armani suit. It's, you know, it tests to what it's actually giving. And, of course, the system can also allow certain action only if we're in a certain state. And how is that done? Well, we're taking the hashes just like we saw before and feeding it to the TPM. 
And when IMA run, it basically feeds all the hashes of the state of the system uh, to the TPM. So every time I run a file, or by default, every time that root opens a file, the hash of that file is fed to the TPM. So I have always a state of the system. And if that state devi deviates from the state we expect, the TPM, for example, can not allow me to get access to certain keys or will refuse to sign um, some uh, a message that tells something remote that the system is OK. Uh, and the IMA model can actually be extended with another model called EVM uh, to allow certain Linux operation to either fail or succeed based on the state. Right? I'm going to run an executable, but if IMA with EVM thinks, no, the hash of that is wrong, I took a picture of that hash, and it's not the same as it needs to be, then it will fail the system. As you see, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to tell you how to use this. Plus, it's rather complicated, but it's an interesting advanced topic. I put here links to where you can find a really good how to, how to do this. And I hope that by now, you're feeling much safer and calm, like this cat that feels so safe that it closes his eyes. And I would like to thank you and hope you took something from it and not least enjoyed it. And please enjoy lunch. Thank you.